Okay, we're going to start a new series, um, and this series is called The Son of God. Um, it's a, one of the central tenets to our faith, the Son, the blood, so forth. Um, this first part, does God have a son? Now, you'll automatically say yes, but you'll see where I'm coming, th- uh, where I'm coming from on this. All of us in this room believe that Yeshua is the son of God, right? Do you believe that Yeshua is the son of God? Can you prove that statement using scripture? Can you prove it? I'm getting some nods, okay? Let's step it up a bit. Can you do so from Tanakh only? Take away the New Testament now. Can you prove that Yeshua is the son of God using Old Testament, using Tanakh alone? All of us believe that Yeshua is divine. I'm not talking about a relationship between father and son here, that Yeshua is divine. Okay, can you prove that statement using scripture? Well, it's very easy with Paul's writings, it outright. Again, I ask the question, can you do so from the Tanakh alone? That's a fair question. Because all of a sudden, do you know your scriptures? Next question. All of us believe that Yeshua is Mashiach, that he's the anointed one. Same question. Can you prove that statement using scripture? Same question again. Can you do so from the Tanakh alone? In fact, can you prove using Tanakh alone that there needs to be a Mashiach? Because you will not find an outright scripture that says there's going to be a Messiah. In, in the sense that we think of it as someone that's going to deliver um, a kingdom and so forth. It's not outright said. Now, again, I ask this because these are central tenets to our faith. In John 1, uh, Yeshua saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, See truly a Yisraelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, From where do you know me? Yeshua answered and said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of Elohim. You are the sovereign of Yisrael. Notice no one picked up stones. Did Nathanael have a Gideon's Bible at hand? A New Testament. He didn't. How is he able to say that comment without a New Testament? How did he know that the king of Israel was also the son of God. Think about that. We, we, we take these things for granted. Oh yeah, because they just is. That's what I've been told. Can you prove, using Tanakh alone, that the coming king of Israel will be the son of God? Using a Tanakh. Take out the book of Hebrews, take out the writings of Paul. Because they could. This is what this series is going to be about, by the way, guys. Matthew 22, verse 41. And when the Pharisees were gathered together, you sure asked them, saying, what do you think concerning the Messiah? So already, they, they, everyone's in agreement there's going to be a Messiah. Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. You sure didn't go, ah, oh, you fools. They answered correctly. Can you find the Messiah only with the scriptures they had at hand? I.e., it's enough. Can you prove that the son of David, there's going to be a son of David that's considered a Messiah? Can you find that the Messiah will be the son of David using Tanakh alone? I would, I'm going to, this is not, uh, uh, I'm not having a, a, a jab at you guys. I would uh, ascertain that maybe more than 75% couldn't. That's just... You know, I'm kind of plucking... In Christianity, that number goes way up, way up. The, the thing is, is that we have all these New Testament, these Brit Hadashah scriptures, and we know of the Old Testament scriptures because of what they wrote. I'm trying to get you to think... So, for the sake of today, and probably the forthcoming series, try to imagine, put yourself in the place that there is no Brit Hadashah at this point. There's no New Testament. Because they were able to come to these conclusions. 
Let's keep going. He said to them, then how does the son of David in the spirit call him master, saying, Yah said to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. If David calls him master, how is he his son? Now, if you read the psalm, the Peshat level, the basic surface understanding, it's about David. So already, both Yeshua and the Pharisees are looking at this psalm in a messianic context. What gave them, what, how were they able to look at that psalm in a messianic context? And don't say, oh, well, it's here in Hebrews 1 quotes it. You're not allowed to use that, okay? How did they know? Can you, can you actually answer those statements? How does David in the spirit call him master? How can he be his son if David calls him master? Can you actually answer that question? Again, I would ascertain that most couldn't. You, you, you suddenly start losing your words, right? Can you do so from the Tanakh alone? Because they did. They, they, they weren't plucking things out of thin air. Most answer these statements in hindsight. These people were doing so in foresight. So we're looking back, having had the writings of the Brit Hadashah, and having some incredibly talented and gifted people put this together for us. Can you come to the same conclusions they did without a New Testament? Because by the way, no one is saying this is incorrect doctrine. Both the Pharisees and Yeshua are aware of what's going on. There's going to be, this is a messianic psalm. Uh, do you see what I'm trying to get at? And this is what I'm trying to say. I, I want you guys to be able to come to these similar conclusions in foresight, not in hindsight. Because we, we come from the point of it's already being given to us. But because of that, we don't actually appreciate truly how wonderful the prophecies are in the Tanakh. We don't understand it through their eyes. So let's look at Hebrews 1. We've read. Let's put a new slant on this. Elohim, verse 1, having of old spoken in many portions and in many ways to the fathers by the prophets. Okay, that's good. We've got the Tanakh, so forth. Has in these last days spoken to us by the Son. Whoa, hold up. Where is he getting that from? Whom he has appointed heir of all. Through whom he also made the ages. I mean, guys, these are massive, bold statements. And we just accept them because we've grown up with this in hindsight, not in foresight. The book of Hebrews didn't have the book of Hebrews. <laughs> Do you see what I'm trying to... The writings of Paul were barely in circulation at this time. Who being the brightness of the esteem and the exact representation of his substance and sustaining all, everything, creation by the word of his power, having made a cleansing of our sins through himself, the Son, sat down at the right hand of the greatness on high. Think about the implications of those statements doctrinally. There's a Son that the Father has appointed heir of all. Now this should bring to mind, my name is Yah and I do not share my glory. Through whom he also made the ages. You mean Yah created through something? Where are they getting these ideas from? Having become so much better than the mass messengers, he has inherited a more excellent name than them. These are very bold claims. Can you make those claims using a Tanakh alone? Because the book of Hebrew, the, the author of the book of Hebrews could. Can you do that? And we're going to see actually as we go forward. Some of these claims may actually be considered false if one is only looking at the Peshat level of understanding. If you look at the Tanakh, just on a surface level, you will not be able to come to those claims. I challenge you. You have to dig deeper. You have to look under the scriptures. We have to remember that prophecy has many facets to it. Okay? How are they able to make such big, bold claims? It doesn't stop here. Let's keep going. For to which of the messengers did he ever say, you are my son, today I have brought you forth? We're going to tackle this psalm, but when you read that psalm, it's talking about David. How do you deal with that? 
And again, I shall be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. We're going to look at that passage today. That's talking of Solomon. How is the writer of Hebrews able to take the... Let's keep going. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the messengers of Elohim do reverence to him. Deuteronomy, the Septuagint, says this. And of the, if you read that, that's the song of Moses, by the way. And it's speaking of Yah. And of the messengers, indeed, he says, who is making his messengers spirits and a servant a flame of fire. Again, we're going to look at this today. This is speaking of Yah. But to the son. So, I, I, whoa, hang on a minute. We're going to look at these scriptures. How is the writer of Hebrews able to say that this is about the son? He says to the son, your throne, O Elohim, is forever and ever. A scepter of straightness is the scepter of your reign. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Because of this, Elohim, your Elohim, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Go read the psalm and tell me, is it outright speaking of a Messiah? Or of, well, you've got the anointing there, but is it speaking of a divine Messiah? Is it speaking of the Son of God? Do you see what I'm getting at? And you, master, did found the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Now look, verse 8 very clearly says, to the Son, he says. And then you get to verse 10, and you, master, did found the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. These are bold claims. They shall perish, but you remain, and they shall grow old like a garment, and like a mantle you shall fold them up, and they shall be changed. But you are the same, and your years shall not fail. And there's the psalm reference for that. Go read the psalm. It speaks of Elohim. It doesn't say that this is to the Son. It's the writer of Hebrews that is saying this is speaking of the Son. How is the right? Can you make that claim without the book of Hebrews? And to which of the messages did he ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Everyone says that that's about Yeshua. I agree, it is about Yeshua on the deeper level. On the surface level, it's very much about David. How do, do, do you see what I'm trying to get at, guys? Are they not all serving spirits sent out to attend those who are about to inherit deliverance? This is the messengers. Um, Hebrews 1 and 2, we're going to look at Hebrews 2 quickly, are a classic example of Jewish midrash, where you take a load of... You quote a load of scriptures and you make a point with those scriptures. The author is taking several passages to make his point and ultimately doctrine. Now in Hebrews 1, he quotes seven passages. Seven passages. The author assumes that the reader knows each of these passages and not just the quoted verses by themselves. So he's quoting single verses, but he's expecting you to know the whole passage that that verse is quoted from. He's expecting you to know that. This is a basic, guys. You should know this, right? The author also assumes that the reader knows of the parallel and equivalent passages. So quite, let, let's take the idea of the branch. There's not just one passage that speaks of the branch. So when someone would say, by the way, that the, the scriptures speak of the branch, you're expected to go to all the places that the branch or the rod of David is speaking of. So when one passage is quoted, you're supposed to also know the parallel passages. Because why? Here a little, there a little. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Yah doesn't give the revelation all in one. He gives it a bit everywhere. And you're supposed to be able to glue these bits together. Quite often, you've, let's take the idea of the branch. Look at all the passages to do with the branch. You'll have similar themes, but you'll also get variances. And it's in the variances, in these little differences, that you're able to build a big, beautiful mosaic of the branch, for example. And it's the same with a lot of things. <clears throat> also assumed is that the reader knows the exposition of these passages, both quoted and their equivalents. So he quoted 2 Samuel there, which clearly speaks of Solomon. The writer of Hebrews is expecting you to know that that is a messianic parallel. Do you know that? So not only do you know the, the, the passage quoted, do you know its equivalence, and do you know the understanding of it? Not the Peshat, the deeper understanding 
Because he's expecting you to know that so that you can understand the point he's making. Only then can we begin to understand how the writers of the Brit Hadashah are formulating their doctrine, doctrine that we accept as truth. But look, I believe that the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, is inspired. It's written by men of Yah. Okay? I believe that. Why? Can I prove that these are inspired writings by, by men of the spirit, so to speak, using the Tanakh alone? Because these are very bold claims and they're not outright stated. Let's look at Hebrews 2 quickly. For it is not the messengers that he has subjected the world to come concerning which we speak. But somewhere one has witnessed, what is man that you remember him or the son of man that you look after him? You have made him a little lower than the messengers. You have crowned him with esteem and respect. I mean, that statement in Jewish thought is like, we'll get to that. And set him over the works of your hands. Remember, Yah doesn't like to share his glory. So why is he crowning someone? You have put all in subjection under his feet, the Son of Man. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left none that is to be subjected to him. But now we do not yet all see subjected to him. So even the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, we have this prophecy and we're not seeing it right now. So what's going on? But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the messengers, Yeshua, because of the suffering of death, crowned with esteem and respect, that by the favor of Elohim he should taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him because of whom all are and through, listen to that statement, through Yeshua, whom all are and through whom all are. These are huge doctrinal statements in bringing many sons to esteem to make the princely leader of their deliverance perfect through sufferings. For both he who sets apart and those who are being set apart are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I shall, whoop, saying, I shall announce your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I shall sing praise to you. The writer of Hebrews is saying, this son, by the way, through whom all things were created, is now calling mankind his brothers. This is incarnation. This is divinity putting on flesh. How is he able to make these statements? And again, I shall put my trust in him. And again, see, I and the children whom Elohim gave me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself similarly shared in the same, the son, so that by the means of his death we might destroy he might destroy him having the power of the death, power of death that is the devil and deliver those who throughout life were held in slavery by fear of death for doubtless he does not take hold of messengers but he take he does take hold of the seed of Abraham he put on flesh so in every way now listen to this statement in every way he had to be made like his brothers. It was necessary in order to become a compassionate and trustworthy high priest in matters related to Elohim to make atonement for the sins of the people. For in what he has suffered, he himself being tried, he is able to help those who are tried. In this chapter, the author is making the claim that it was necessary for Yeshua to come in flesh. Can you make that statement using a Tanakh alone? These are very, very bold claims. Why do you think the Pharisees had a cow with, to some of the statements Yeshua gave? How does the author get to these conclusions? Because we, we take it for granted. We've grown up with it. Oh, it must be right. It must be right. I'm not saying it isn't. I believe it is correct. Very much so. But how do they get to that place? Would we be able to come to the same conclusions had the book of Hebrews not being written? That's my challenge. Everything you've just read in Hebrews 1 and 2, could you come to the same conclusion had this book not been written? Even I couldn't do that. I, th- these guys knew their scripture and they had the spirit truly guiding them. 
These passages, these are the passages quoted just in Hebrews 1 and 2. Psalm 2, 7, 2 Samuel, 7, so that's about Solomon, the 2 Samuel chapter. Deuteronomy 32, 43, that's about Yah. So already, David, Solomon, uh, Elohim. Psalm 104, Psalm 45, Psalm 102, Psalm 110, Psalm 8. Psalm 22, we all know, most of us know Psalm 22, Isaiah 8, just in two chapters, and he's quoting them, and he's expecting you to understand not only the passage, all their relative passages, and the deeper understanding to them, because that's how he was able to say, Yeshua is the son of Elohim, through whom all the ages were created. Do we understand all these passages? Do we actually, un- we think we do, but do we understand them? Do we have eyes to see? Do we know the critically necessary deeper understanding to these passages? Because if you read these passages just on a simple Peshat understanding, you, you, you just won't see it. And this is what actually trips up a lot of Jews today. Do we know how to thread these together? Because these are about different people. We've got David, Elohim, Solomon... How are these all talking about the same son? Do we know how to thread these together? They could. We just take it for granted. Do we know our scripture? That's what it boils down. Do you actually know your scripture? Do you know how to interpret it? Do you know how to bring things together thematically? This is, what are we putting our eternal life in the trust of? Think about this. We put our faith, our eternal life, in the hope of Messiah. But you don't even know the scriptures well enough to be able to get to those conclusions. I'm not saying that faith in, the faith in Messiah is critical. And I understand that not everyone's a, a Hebrew scholar, da, da, da. But you're putting your eternal faith in this. I'd like to at least re- know that you know what you're putting your faith into. And this is what this series is about. I want us, to, we're actually going to take the New Testament aside for how, generally, we're going to actually learn to thread these together how they would have. Look, to look at the deeper, the remez, the drash, even the sowed in some cases. This is uh, Yeshua speak on the road to Emmaus. And he said to them, O thoughtless ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these and to enter into his esteem? And beginning at Moshe and all the prophets, he was explaining to them all in the scriptures the matters concerning himself. Could you do the same using Tanakh alone? You sh- okay, yeah, of course you sure could. Okay? But so could the other people around him. They were, in fact, even the Pharisees were waiting for a Messiah. Where did they get this idea from? And Yeshua says he endorsed the idea. He claimed to be the Messiah. This is what this series is about. Psalm 139, 7, where would I go from your spirit or where would I flee from your face? If I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, see, you are there. I take the wings of the morning, I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. There too your hand would lead me and your right hand would hold me. 1 Kings 8, 27, for is it true Elohim dwells on the earth? See the heavens and the heaven of the heavens are unable to contain you. How much less this house which I have built. Jeremiah 23, 23. Am I an Elohim close by, declares Yah, and not an Elohim afar off? If anyone is hidden in secret places, would I not see him, declares Yah? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares Yah? Elohim is beyond creation. However, we have clear anthropomorphic instances of Elohim interacting with his creation. So bodily appearances is what that means. Bodily appearances. How do we reconcile these things? This is where the understanding of the word of Yah came from. Now, this series is going to build on top of parts one and two of the divinity unveiled. 
So in part one, we looked at the blurring between the angel of the Lord, the messenger of Yah, and how there seems to be this blurring. Is it the messenger? Is it Yah? Things like the burning bush, the pillar of cloud for the exodus, the binding of Isaac. And in the second part, we specifically look at this idea of the word, you know, because this was a common understanding in, uh, in the first century Judaism. So this is kind of going to build on top of this. Um, so it's useful to have just that in the back of your mind. The concept of Elohim having a son is actually directly linked to this understanding. The messenger, the word, so forth. The goal is to understand how the ancients would have understood the concept of divine sonship. Because we have a Western idea of that. How would the ancients have seen that? Now, we're not going to answer this question today, I'm afraid. This is going to be an ongoing thing. This is what's driving this. So, let's start pulling some of these scriptures apart and delving deep. 2 Samuel 7, 12. When your days are filled, this is Yah speaking to David through the prophet Nathan. So David wants to build a temple for Yah. And the, the, Nathan comes back to him and says this. When your days are filled and you rest with your fathers, I shall raise up your seed after you, who comes from your inward parts, and I shall establish his reign. He does build me a house for my name, and I shall establish the throne of his reign forever. It says Leo Lam in there. I am to be his father, he is to be my son. If he does perversely, I shall reprove him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. Now, in ancient culture, the king was seen as the, aid, the viceroy, as it were, of the deity for that nation. The concept of the king being the son of God was also in pagan culture. It wasn't a new, just a strictly Israelite concept. But my kindness does not turn aside from him, as, I, as it turned aside from Shaul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your reign are to be steadfast forever. Before you, your throne is established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Now, there's the parallel passage. That's First Chronicles 17, 11. We're gonna, so there's an interesting difference we'll get to. This is also quoted in Hebrews 1, 5. We just covered it. Um, second half. And again, I shall be to him a father, and he shall be my son. Now, the writer of Hebrews is making this about Yeshua. We've just read it. This is clearly talking on the Peshat level about Solomon. What's going on? Could you make that passage about Messiah? The parallel passages, uh, passage in Chronicles has a very interesting difference. In 2 Samuel 7, 16, it says, And your house and your reign are to be steadfast before you. Your throne is established forever. Chronicles is really interesting. And I shall establish him in my house and in my reign and let his throne be established forever. That changes it. Think about that. Because now this is talking about reigning in Elohim's kingdom. This brings up the conundrum. How does the son have a throne in Elohim's reign as Elohim does not share his glory? Glory was linked to kingship back then, the kavod. Because look, Yah is clearly saying, you, you, you can have a throne in my kingdom. Now, people will say, oh, well, what about Revelation? You know, there's going to be the 12 thrones and 24. Again, take, re, stop thinking through New Testament lens. You need to be able to prove this from the front of the book. This promise is also problematic in light of the exile. Because what David said, there was even a, a, a curse put on Jeconia, right? In this passage, El is not a man to lie, nor a son of man to repent. Has he said and would he not do it, or spoken and not confirm it? So Yah's made a very clear promise to David, what happened during the exile? Did Yah forget his promise? Did Yah think, ah, I've changed my mind, 
Yah doesn't change his mind. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that they realize, hang on, we know Yah, this is faith in action. We know Yah doesn't lie. Therefore, he has to fulfill his promise. How he's going to do it? And this is where Messiahship started coming about. Now, let's look at this. I shall establish him in my house and in my reign forever. Let his throne be established forever. What house is this speaking of? What house? Um, what house is this speaking of in context? What was David wanting to build? Temple. So this is, I shall establish him in my temple and in my kingdom. So the seed of David will serve both in the temple and on the throne. What does this bring up? We've gone through this type of stuff, the priest king. This is where that they start getting these ideas of that this coming seed of David will serve in a kingly function and in a priestly function. By the way, Chronicles was written after the exile. So they've already got this kind of messianic ideology coming through. Psalm 89, verse 19. So this psalm was written during the exile. During the exile. Then you spoke in a vision to your kind one and you said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David with my set apart oil. I have anointed him. This is clearly speaking of David. And here it says, Beshemen Kadshi, so my set apart oil, Meshachtiv. These letters here is Mashiach. So the, 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 the Mashiach is the noun, a anointed one, and you can Mashiach, so to anoint. So th this is, but is it, who's it talking about? David, okay? So let's keep going forward. With whom my hand is established, my arm also strengthens him. No enemy subjects him to tribute, and no son of wickedness afflicts him. And I shall beat down his adversaries before his face and plague those who hate him. But my trustworthiness and my kindness are with him and in my name his horn is exalted. And I shall set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He calls out to me, you are my father, my El, my God, and the rock of my deliverance, the rock of my salvation. It literally says Yeshua in there. I also appoint him firstborn, highest of the sovereigns of all the earth. So now we have Solomon being called Yah's son. We have David, because David's calling him my father. He's appointed firstborn. Verse 27 has huge implications. Again, we read right over these things. So here, I also appoint him firstborn, highest of the sovereigns of the earth. This is Moshe speaking to Pharaoh, and you shall say to Pharaoh, thus said Yah, Yisrael is my firstborn. Has Yah now, did he forget? My firstborn, so I say to you, let my son go and serve me. But if you refuse to see, let him go, see, I am killing your son, your firstborn. Is Yah confused? We have Elohim specifying who within Yisrael is firstborn. There's still no discrepancy here. David is, is of Israel. Let's keep going. This word, highest, this is the Hebrew. Elion is the word for highest. Now, this should maybe prick up some ears. Elion, it means high, upper, highest, most high. It's used of Yah, as in most high God. So El Elion means God most high. This word appears 53 times in the Tanakh, 53 times. 19 times it refers to objects or places in terms of physical location or in being exalted, like the temple. So the temple was exalted above every other house. It was made Elion, the temple, higher than all the other houses. It's also used um, in the temple precinct. There was a gate called the Upper Gate, the Elion Gate. There was a pool which was called the Upper Pool. So, and there was upper and lower Bethesda, upper Elion. That's what it's talking of. Twice it refers to Israel as a nation, being made high above all the other nations. This is critical, because it's speaking of a nation, not an individual there. 
31 times it is a direct reference to Yah as Most High. When, when you see the Most High, it says Elion. And then, the, the only time it's actually used of an individual is when it refers to Yah himself. But then there's this verse. What do we do with it? I believe there's, there's a hint here. So it's literally saying, I will make this king high above all kings. But the, the only time this word is used in regards to an individual is of Yah. Jewish sages picked up on this, by the way. This begs the question, who is the most high king? Because he's speaking to David, right? Well, he's speaking of David. Is David now the most high king? King of kings, Lord of lords. Psalm 47, 2 and 7, for Yah most high is awesome, a great sovereign over all the earth. For Elohim is sovereign of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. Deuteronomy 10, 17, for Yah your Elohim is God of gods and master of masters. The great, our mighty and awesome who shows no partiality nor takes a bride. So is Yah confused? Has he forgotten that he's the most high when he's saying to David, or spoken of David, I make him Elion? Again, is Elohim known for sharing his glory? No. Let's keep going. I guard my kindness with him forever. What happened during the exile then? My covenant is steadfast with him, and I shall establish his seed forever, and his throne as the days of the heavens. If his sons forsake my Torah and do not walk in my right rulings, if they profane my laws and do not guard my commands. Now this is a quote, guys, from what we just read in 2 Samuel. Then I shall visit their transgression with the rod and their crookedness with flogging. But my kindness I do not take away from him, nor be false to my trustworthiness. I shall not profane my covenant. So again, what happened during the exile? Neither would I change what has gone out from my lips. Yah actually allowed the exile to occur by saying, if they transgress my Torah, I will flog them. That was the exile right there. Once I have sworn by my set apartness, I do not lie to David. His seed shall be forever in his throne as the sun before me. I don't see David ruling right now. It's, you know, David died. Like the moon, it is established forever, and the witness in the heaven is steadfast, Salah. This psalm was written during the exile. It's actually one of the things uh, the guy is reminding Yah of his promises, because then at the end it says, Yah, where are your former kindnesses which you swore to David in your trustworthiness? Because they've just been carted off to Babylon. So he's reminding Yah of his promises Blessed be Yah forever. Amen, ver amen. Psalm 2. This is quoted in Hebrews. Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples meditate emptiness? Do, are you guys seeing some things here? This is why you can't look at these scriptures with just push out understanding. You have to kind of dig deeper. Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples meditate emptiness? The sovereigns of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against Yah and against his Messiah. It says against his Mashiach in there, his anointed one. Now we've just read in Psalm 89, 20 that David is the anointed one. I have found my servant David with my set-apart oil, I have anointed him. So again, on a Pasha understanding, this is talking of David. This is the simple Pasha understanding. This is what I'm saying. How were the writers of the Brit able to come to these wonderful conclusions? Let us tear apart their bonds and throw away their ropes from us. He who is sitting in the heaven laughs, Yah mocks at them. Then he speaks to them in his wrath and troubles them in his rage, saying, But I have set my sovereign on Zion, my set-apart mountain. Just as a little hint, Yah gave me an amazing insight to this verse, which I will share later in the series. I believe it, you're talking sowed level. It's incredible. There's a beautiful thing there. I inscribe for a law. Yah has said to me, you are my son. Today I have brought you forth. Who are we talking about? Yah's anointed one. His Mashiach, which is 
David. Second Samuel, again, when your days are filled with your rest and your fathers, I shall raise up your seed after you. Who comes from your inward parts, he builds me a house. I shall establish his, the throne of his reign forever. I am to be his father, he is to be my son. So now David is the son, Solomon is the son. Do, do you see what I'm getting at, guys? Psalm 89, he calls out to me, you are my father, my El, and the rock of my deliverance. I also appoint him firstborn, highest of all the sovereigns. You have to start threading these psalms together, guys. Because each one of them gives another little detail. Here a little, there a little. Precept upon precept. Ask of me, and I make the Gentiles your inheritance. The nations, that's what that means. And the ends of the earth your possession. Did David ever inherit the nations? David only ruled over Israel and Judah. Did David ever inherit the ends of the earth? Is Yah lying? No. So again, there's got to be a deeper understanding to this. Therefore, this must be speaking of David's seed. We're, we're, we thread these passages together. Break them with a rod of iron. Dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Where do you automatically go to there? That's not the one I was thinking. Where would most people go there? Most people will go to Revelation. It's actually Isaiah. Isaiah 11. And a rod shall come forth from the stump of Yishai, seed of David, and a sprout from his roots shall bear fruit. The spirit of Yah shall rest upon him. This is anointed language. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yah. And I shall make him breathe in the fear of Yah. There's a beautiful uh, thing here in regards to um, Jacob and Esau. How did uh, Isaac try to recognize his smell? Anyway, he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and he shall decide with straightness for the meek ones of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and slay the wrong with the breath of his lips." If you chase these words through scripture, the, the breath is linked to the wrath, his wrath being kindled. And now be wise, O sovereigns, be instructed, you rulers of the earth. Serve Yah with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be enraged. And you perish in the way, for his wrath is soon to be kindled. Blessed are those taking refuge in him. By the way, to kiss the son is where it was uh, to pay homage. You know, when you greet someone and you kiss their hand, it's that sort of thing. Now, the Hebrew word there for son is not the usual ben, it's bar, which implies more of an heir, an heir to inherit everything. It has, it, it is closer, it, so it's weird. David's using a different word here. Let's look at this. Whose wrath is to be kindled? Is the, the Hebrew is actually ambiguous. Now, we know of the wrath of Yah, Zephaniah 2, before the decree is born, the day shall pass on like chaff, before the burning wrath of Yah comes, uh, comes upon you, before the day of wrath of Yah comes upon you. Seek Yah, all you meek ones of the earth, you who have done his right ruling. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. If so, be that you are hidden in the day of wrath. It's interesting that being hidden from the wrath is linked to obedience to his commands. In whom is refuge sought? Again, the, the, the Hebrew in the psalm is actually ambiguous. But we know elsewhere, trust in Yah forever, for in Yah, Yah is rock of ages. The reason I bring this up is because you, it's actually up to interpretation as whose rage it is and whom is being sought for refuge. Because here it says, serve Yah with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son. Now it can be that lest he be enraged that the subject is Yah. But it's just as possible for it to be the son. It depends how you read it and how you group it together. Now, the reason I say this is because the son is spoken of in verse 7. Just earlier on, I inscribed for you a law. Yah has said to me, you are my son. Today I have brought you forth. And this is equated to Yah's Mashiach. 
So this is what I'm saying. It can be, you can, whose wrath is it? Now, we know from hindsight that Yeshua treads in the wine press. But again, pretend you don't know that, right? <laughs> so let's have a quick recap. David is told that his seed will build the house of Elohim. This is what we're covering. I'm just going to succinct it for you guys. David's seed is called Elohim's son, i.e. Solomon in 2 Samuel 7. Elsewhere, David is called Elohim's son and firstborn. David is told that his seed will rule forever. How do we deal with that in light of the exile? This is where one of the ideas of a Messiah that Yah will one day fulfill his promises, because Yah does not lie. He's not a man that he should lie. The son is appointed, is the, the son is the king appointed in Zion by Elohim. We read that. I have set my king in Zion. Now that's problematic because Yah doesn't like to share his glory. This king will possess all the nations. All the nations. In fact, he inherits the, uh, the ends of the earth, right? This king will break them with a rod of iron. Isaiah builds on this by saying it will be that the rod and branch of Jesse that will judge the earth with the rod of his mouth. And then that leads you onto a whole different trail. You find the branch in Zephaniah, so forth. We're going to cover all these things slowly over this series. But we need to, I'm try, I've tried my best to kind of pace ourselves because this is a lot of information to take in. To not kiss the sun results in perishing. Now the word there means death, like gone, by, forever. Perish. Now, the reason I've recapped this is because now we're going to dig deep. I, I, you, you, I need your attention on this one, guys. Let's take this first now, Psalm 27. This is directly quoted in Hebrews. And we're going to show how you link this to other passages, how um, the writer of Hebrews, when he quotes this verse, you should be thinking of all the passages that are going to follow. This takes us on a beautiful trail. And again, I've had to kind of stagger it because, put it this way, guys, one of the revelations this week, I was in tears. It's that beautiful. Proverbs 8. So please note, we've got two subjects here. You are my son, I have brought you forth. These are the two. Now, we need to trace these phrases throughout scripture. Proverbs 8. This is speaking of wisdom. Yah possessed me in the beginning of his the, possessed me, sorry, the beginning of his ways as the first of his works of old. I was set up ages ago at the first before the earth ever was. When I was when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs heavy with water. Now, in Psalm the brought forth of Psalm 27, and this brought forth a, a slightly different Hebrew words, but they're words that have like a dual meaning. And the common dual meaning in both these words is travailing. One is linked more with birth and travail, i.e. labor. And the, the second word is more in regards of writhing in pain. But they both have the same theme. Before the mountains were sunk, before the hills, I was brought forth. This is linking through phrases now, this is how the ancient sages used to link passages. This is why if you read like a Jewish writing, you go, how the heck are they connecting these two things? It's, it's in the language. Before he had made the earth and the fields or the first dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he decreed a vault on the face of the deep, when he set the clouds above, when he made the fountains of the deep strong, when he gave the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he decreed the foundations of the... Notice he's speaking things into existence. He's decreeing it. He's not for, he's decreeing it by the power of his word. There I was beside him, a master workman, and I was his delight day by day, rejoicing before him all the time. So now we're adding another theme to being brought forth, creation. You have son being brought forth, you have wisdom being brought forth, but creation is now being brought into this. This tells us that the son was pre-existent, before the creation. Because they were both brought forth. You need to link through the, the son was brought forth and he was also what? The firstborn, right? 
Now, we've just read here that wisdom was brought forth and was the first of all his works. They're both firstborns, is what I'm saying. Does that make sense? I'm getting some puzzled faces. Look, it's going to be hard because we think Greek. And I'm showing you Hebraic understanding. Both the son and wisdom are brought forth. The son is called the firstborn. Wisdom was called the first of his works. It's the firstborn. So they're linked now. This tells us that the son existed before creation. This also tells us that the son is eternal, as Elohim has always had wisdom. If the son is created, wisdom was created. It was in creation that we saw Elohim's wisdom demonstrated, i.e. brought forth. This is, this is the understanding. By doing what he did, his wisdom was manifested. First Corinthians, let, let's, let's add some, some New Testament. First Corinthians 1.23, Yet we proclaim Messiah impaled to the Yehudim a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Well, it's a stumbling block to the Jews because there, there was a divine claim to Yeshua. But to those who are called, both Yehudim and Greeks, listen to this, Messiah, the power of Elohim and the wisdom of Elohim. Do you think Paul is aware of these passages? Of course he is. We read elsewhere that it was through the Son that everything was created. He says this in Colossians 1. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, 8. But we speak the wisdom of Elohim, which was hidden in a secret, and which Elohim ordained before the ages. When was the lamb slain? From the foundation of the world. For our esteem, which no, none of the rulers of, the, of this age knew, for if they had known, they would not have impaled the master of esteem. We're going to link Yeshua to Yah's honor and esteem and glory in the forthcoming uh, teachings. Is everyone with me so far? So the son was brought forth and is also called the firstborn. Wisdom was the first of all the works and is also brought forth. So this is linked now. And now the son is linked to creation because through wisdom there was creation. Let's look at Psalm 104. Bless Yah, O my being, O Yah, my... By the way, this is quoted as well, one of the other verses in Hebrews 2, uh, 1. Bless Yah, O my being, O Yah, my Elohim, you have been very great. You have put on excellency and splendor, covering yourself with light as a garment. It's funny because um, Yeshua calls himself the light of the world. Stretching out the heavens like a curtain who is laying the beams of his upper rooms in the waters, who is making thick clouds of his chariot, who is walking on the wings of the wind. So we've got creation language in there. Uh, Making his messengers the winds, his servants a flame of fire. So when Hebrews is quoting this, you're supposed to be thinking of all of this. He established the earth on its foundation so that it would not totter forever. You covered it with the deep as a garment. The water stood above the mountains. So it goes through all the amazing, wondrous works of Yah, the whole psalm. Jump down to 24. Oh Yah, how many have been your works? You have made all of them in wisdom. The earth is filled with your possessions. The psalmist is telling you that the world was created in wisdom. Now, link it, can you link it through? The sun was pre-existent, that it was brought forth, and now we're linking creation into it. This tells us that the sun is responsible for creation. This matches up with what we read in the Brit. John 1, by the word of Elohim, all things were made. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Paul, Colossians 1, 14, I think. Psalm 33, 6. Let's throw another one there. By the word of Yah, the heavens were made and all their host by the spirit of his mouth. So now the word is wisdom. Oh, that's interesting because we read in the Proverbs, through your word, by your Torah, I, have, I am so much wiser than the elders. I gain great understanding because of your word. Again, are you starting to see now how maybe some of the ancients would have been able to say the son was pre-existent, responsible for creation, therefore he has to be divine? We haven't gone into the Brit yet. We haven't even gone into the Brit. This is all Old Testament. 
This is Psalms and Proverbs. This is actually before the prophets, apart from the Isaiah one we brought up. Let's keep, the, the trail doesn't end here, guys. This doesn't end here. Let's keep going. Proverbs 30, verse 4. Who has gone up to the heavens and come down? Who has gathered the wind into his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? I mean, this is what we've been reading about how Yah does all these wonderful things. Who established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know it? This is, this is a rhetorical, the, the first bit, what is his name? It's clearly talking of Yah. Yah has a son. How did Solomon know that? Solomon, uh, Proverbs was written before Isaiah. I think it helps that, you know, they were being visited by the word. That's got something to do with it. Please note the reoccurrence of the creation language and theme. The son, so the son is the firstborn. The son was brought forth. Wisdom was brought forth. Wisdom was responsible for creation. And now, so all these things are linked. Yah created everything in wisdom. And now this is linking us back to the son through creation. Now, this, are you linking these things together? These are the sort of passages you have to have all of them in front of you and you kind of stand back and then it all comes into focus. And when that does, hallelujah is all I can say. Has anyone ever asked what the son's name is? This is a question. And what is his son's name if you know it? Has the question ever been asked? What is your name? And Yaakov was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he did not overcome him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Yaakov's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I am not letting you go until you have blessed me. So he asked him, what is your name? And he said, Yaakov. And he said, your name is no longer called Yaakov, but Yisrael, because you have striven with Elohim and with men and have overcome. And Yaakov asked him, saying, please let me know your name. And he said, why do you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. Hmm, interesting, especially in light of what we may or may not know in light of the messenger of Yah. Let's keep going. Then Manoach said to the messenger of Yah, what is your name? When your words come true, then we shall esteem you. And the messenger of Yah said, why do you ask my name since it is wondrous? Now we get another detail. This is why you need to compare, you need to take a phrase or a sentence structure and follow it through scripture, take the whole passage and you'll find these beautiful little differences and they paint this beautiful mosaic. This tells us that the messenger of Yah is the bodily manifestation of wisdom and of the sun. Think about this. So, okay, you guys are going, uh. wisdom was brought forth like the sun. So they're connected by phraseology and theme. Elohim created in wisdom. So wisdom is now responsible for creation, like a co-agent. But the sun was brought forth like wisdom. Creation is linked to asking what Elohim's name is, as well as that of his son. We've just read, what, you know, all these wonderful, wonderful works. What is his name and what is his son's name? So now the asking of the name is being linked into this creation. We have the messenger of Yah asking, having his name inquired of. All these are connected. Again, how you, you can't get this unless you dig, unless you search the scriptures, unless you, look, you drill down. Okay, so the word there for wondrous is pili. Wonderful, incomprehensible, extraordinary. Now please note the spelling, uh, pe, lamid, aleph, yod. Okay? Remember that. Let's go to Isaiah 9. For a child shall be born unto us, a son shall be given unto us. Every, now everything that you, remember, Isaiah is after the Psalms, after Proverbs. So when Isaiah is saying, a son shall be given unto us, the sages, their ears should be pricking up going, we know of a son. And the rule is on his shoulder. 
And his name is called Wonder, Counselor, Strong El. It literally says El Gibor there. Father of continuity. Now, this says Aviad in the Hebrew. It's father of the ages is a better translation. Ad is used in terms of ages, eons. Prince of peace, Sach Shalom. Of the increase of his rule and the peace, there is no end. Upon the throne of David and over his reign, to establish it and sustain it with right ruling and with righteousness from now on, even forever. The ardor, the zeal of Yah of hosts does this. Now the word there for wonder is Pele. Pe, Lamed, Aleph. Same root word. Wonder, marvel, extraordinary. Hard to understand thing. What, was, what did the messenger of Yah say to Manoach? Why do you ask about my name since it is Pili? And here we're, t- we're being told. Now you link the messenger of Yah to this chap, the son, who's called Wanda. You read in Revelation that Yeshua has a name which no one can read and comprehend. Where are they getting that from? Link it through. This tells us that Elohim's son is the seed promised to David. We've just read the Psalms that says, of your seed, you are my son. This is the root and branch of David. We get this from Isaiah 11. This tells us that divinity will put on flesh. Why? Because a child shall be born unto us. A son shall be given unto us. Be born a child. Now there's a whole understanding. We'll get to it in the word child. The, the, the young lad. The, the, the na'ah. I hope this is, this is just the beginning, guys. This is, I, I promise you, I had to purposely stop here because it's heavy, it's deep, it's beautiful. And we're going we're gonna to keep thinking like this and we're going to kind of lay aside the, the Brit Hadashah, not because we disrespect it, but because if you really understood how those writers understood their Tanakh, all of a sudden... When they make comments like the son of Elohim who created everything, and when you realize that they connected that to Yeshua, my goodness, like scripture, (laughs) all I can say is I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to teaching this to you guys. I hope this was a blessing. Amen.